everyone. I know I am the last act standing between you all in happy hour, so I'm gonna do my best to power through this to make it worth your while. I think a couple of years ago, I was the last act standing between everyone and lunch, so let's see which one's worse. <laughs> All right, so today I'm here to talk to you all about how to combat subscription fatigue with a membership mentality. Now, a lot of you might be thinking, aren't subscriptions and memberships basically the same thing? And I can see why you would think that, because they're often used interchangeably, and a lot of subscriptions like to call themselves memberships. However, if you distill them down to their core, foundationally, they are fundamentally different. Subscriptions are transactional, while memberships are relational. I'm going to repeat that. Subscriptions are transactional, while memberships are relational. To bring this to life, I want you all to do me a favor and think about what it feels like to subscribe to something. Let's say it's a magazine or a grocery delivery service. Now, I'll take a moment and think about what it feels like to be a member of something. So maybe it's a country club or the product con community that's here today. Do you notice that difference? Now, I want you to take a moment and think about the subscriptions that you have. If you were to refer to yourself as a member of those services, would that feel weird or does that sound strange versus a subscriber? So that nuance and that feeling is the crux of my talk today. I'm gonna to be talking about how we can explore how subscription products can become stickier by adopting qualities of true and genuine memberships. So before I jump in, I'll share a little bit about my background. A lot of, like a lot of folks here today, I started my career in management consulting, so working with Fortune 500 companies initially. Then I moved on to work with early and growth stage startups. I've had a lot of different product roles that range from super technical digital enterprise products to more consumer-facing ones in the entertainment side of the business. Um, as she mentioned today, I lead product and engineering for Prime Gaming. And for folks that don't know, Prime Gaming is an awesome Amazon benefit. It gives you access to free games and gaming perks. Now, throughout my career, I've had the chance to work on a lot of different subscription and membership businesses, and I've learned a lot about the social and behavioral psychology of what it keeps folks hooked. And that's been the inspiration for today's talk. So today, I'm going to take you through an overview of subscription businesses. We're going to talk about the qualities of traditional memberships. And we're going to talk about how to apply the membership mentality to a subscription business to help you increase loyalty as well as retention. So first, let's start off with basic definitions. What is a subscription? Subscriptions are a revenue model where customers pay a recurring price in exchange for a service or product. That's all that it is, it's straightforward, it's about consumption. So subscribers like this model because it's cost efficient for them and it's convenient. Businesses have historically loved this model because it gives them predictable revenue, it allows them to scale a lot easier, and a lot of them take a sort of set it and forget it approach so they think there's not a ton of oversight that's needed. And businesses have loved this so much that there's been a 435% increase in the number of subscription businesses in the last 10 years. In fact, it's supposed to reach $1.5 trillion by next year in terms of market size. So based on these numbers, I am curious. Um, and let's be a little interactive here. Can you give me a show? Start, I want you guys to think about the number of subscriptions you have, come up with an estimate in your mind, and I want you to raise your hands if you have more than three subscriptions. Okay, that's almost everybody here. Um, keep your hands up, no, keep your hands up. All right, keep them up if you have more than five. Okay, more than 10. All right, about 50% now, more than 15. All right, just like one or two folks, more than 20? All right, not, no one over 20 here. Um, I'd love to see for the folks that are online how many you all have too. But the average American has about 12 subscriptions and they spend about $270 a month on them. So I see some surprise faces and you guys are not alone because the average American also usually grossly underestimates how much they spend on subscriptions by $100 to $200 a month. So, if you're surprised by this, I get it. So why don't we talk through how a day in the life of a subscription economy might look like to bring it to life. So let's say we all start off, maybe we kickstart our day with retail, 
I put on an outfit from Rent the Runway. Um, I do some grooming from my Birchbox. Then I might start working with some productivity and collaboration tools, things like Asana, a Slack. I get a little hungry, so I decide to do a meal kit for lunch. If I'm lazy, I'll do a Thackard meal. If I'm feeling industrious, I'll make something from Blue Apron. In the afternoon, I decide to do a little professional development. So maybe I'll use my LinkedIn premium to stalk some past coworkers and do, take a few classes through Coursera. In the afternoon, I might take a lift over and take a class pass with yoga, and I'll track my biometrics with my Fitbit premium. Then when I get home, I unpack some groceries, some for myself, some for my pet, so I might unpack the farmer's dog or the Instacart. And then lastly, in the evening, I have a whole slew of entertainment options. I can do stuff with gaming, I could do streaming. So looking at all this, you can see how we get those numbers and how they've actually added up. And it's very clear that subscriptions have you know, permeated our everyday lives. But they've also permeated our wallets, and they're costing us a ton of money. So there's this growing burden now from financial strain, from the number of choices, and from the complexity of having to manage so many numerous recurring subscriptions. And this is what's become known as subscription fatigue. So subscription fatigue happens when customers are starting to feel overwhelmed. They can't keep track of what they have. They don't know if it's actually truly valuable. As a result of this, they're starting to churn out. And in fact, it's actually led to companies being created like Rocket Money, whose literal purpose is to help you manage and cancel your subscriptions. Now, every company and industry is not equally vulnerable here, and there's different ways to figure out how to measure vulnerability. But I like to look at it as a cross-section between how critical or perceived essentialness um, a product is, as well as how many options there are in the market. And if we do this, we get four quadrants here. Those on the bottom, these are going to be the areas that are actually least vulnerable to subscription fatigue. So we'll start on the right here with monopolized necessities. These are things that are really difficult to live without. So think of things like Wi-Fi, your phone companies, um, SaaS, SaaS services like Microsoft Office for businesses. Because they're important and there are very few comp there's very few competition, you're probably not going to see mass cancellation here. On the left are niche novelties. These are not essential, but they're unique, and they're, they're liked and appeal to a targeted market. So here you can think about things like um, hobbyist, you know, hobbyist kits, maybe niche streaming services like Crunchyroll. Because they have such a loyal following and because they're unique, unique and specialized, you're not going to see mass cancellation here either because people like what they're like and they're going to stick to it. At the top here, these are going to be the most vulnerable. So again, at the top left, or top right rather, we have competitive essentials. These are things that everyone would categorically agree is really important. So think about things like cloud storage, grocery delivery, um, you know, popular streaming services like Netflix. People see them as important, so they're not going to cancel them all, but they are going to be more likely to switch between competitors. And the top left here are oversaturated luxuries. These are the ones that are most in danger of being canceled because they're, they're not seen as super important, and there are a lot of options that are out there. So examples of this might be things like wine and snack boxes, a lot of digital content sites that sit behind a paywall, beauty boxes, things like this. We see a lot of competition, and we see a lot of switching based off of things like price and promotions. And when there's an economic downturn, they're going to be the first to go. So what are companies doing? They're struggling to survive. And they've taken different approaches for how to survive. Some companies have looked at things like acquisition. They're, they're, gonna, they're aggregating, they're combining with competitors, they're looking at bundling and being a single place where customers have less choice. Uh, well, not less choice, a single place where um, it's a little bit more convenient for customers. Um, and other companies who don't have the same deep pockets or negotiating power are unfortunately looking at things like increasing their prices. They're looking at um, really confusing terms and conditions, as well as complex cancellation flows. So instead of doing all this, I want to make the case today instead to apply a membership mentality. So what are memberships if they're not the same as subscriptions? At their core, 
Memberships are an ongoing relationship between a member and an organization where there's mutual benefit. It leans into social connection. So why is social connection better? Social connection is important because it continues to matter. Despite unprecedented digital connectivity, people today are experiencing feelings of isolation and disconnection. Last year, the US Surgeon General actually declared that we are in, um, we actually have a loneliness epidemic and it's a public health crisis. He mentioned how loneliness and lack of social connection is associated with things like risk of heart disease, stroke, dementia, and premature death. In fact, lack of social connection was basically similar to smoking up to 15 cigarettes a day in terms of mortality rate. So you can see here why it's important to lean into that. The pandemic brought a lot of this to light, and since then, people are continuing to search for ways to build and maintain genuine connections. So I posit that subscriptions that lean into this, into creating relationships versus just transactions, will not only fulfill these deep-seated human needs, but they're going to be able to build lasting loyalty. So let's look at some examples of traditional memberships. So here we have the Girl Scouts, we have fraternities, and we have churches. What are some things that these all have in common? Shout it out. Identity, identity, relationships, right? They're all deeply engaged. So yes, absolutely right. Other things that they have in common is like, despite struggling at times, these have been able to endure their time by adapting to different needs. So for example, the Girl Scouts, it, they've since leaned a lot into STEM programs. So you can literally get badges now for coding and robotics. Fraternities now lean a lot into things like mental health and diversity. And churches or religious affiliations have really adopted technology now, so you can have things like mobile apps for churches. So it's important to recognize these things. Um, but the most important factor and the most important commonality across all of these is that they appeal to psychological needs and motivators. Things like making you feel like you're part of something that's exclusive, that you have status, that there is a sense of belonging and you're sharing something with other people. For the Girl Scouts, it's community. For fraternities, it's brotherhood. And for churches, it's spirituality. So let's do a midpoint check here. So we're halfway through. We're almost there, folks, um, about some of the things that we've discussed and learned. So on the, on the side of subscriptions, we discussed how subscriptions add value because they're convenient, they're cost efficient, um, they're often static and consistent for all subscribers. Additionally, they're often transactional, and it's about individual consumption. Memberships, on the other hand, they lean into things like exclusivity, belonging, purpose. It feels a little bit more dynamic. It's more personal. A lot of it's more relationship-based and about engagement with the community. And to bring this to life on this continuum, I'll take you all through just a quick example. So let's look at things like the fitness and health space. An example there is something like Allo Moves. So Allo Moves is a company, it's owned by Allo, which is an athletic clothing company, and Allo Moves is their digital subscription. It allows you to have access to classes online to things like HIIT and yoga and meditation. And um, it basically, it's a lot of self-guided learning. You can subscribe to it, get access to these things, and they update the content. But beyond that, there aren't too many features around connection. On the other hand side, we have the YMCA which we're all probably pretty familiar with. It is a membership. Um, it also has things like fitness and sports, but instead, folks do usually do these together. They also have things like learning programs and a community youth support group, and it's centered around a shared mission. And in the middle here, we might have something like the Daily Burn. The Daily Burn is similar to Allo Moves in that it's an online subscription, gives you access to classes and things like that. But what makes it different is that it also has social features. You can connect with the community. You can also personalize your journey. So here we can see the emergence of this sort of hybrid model, where a subscription company has applied and adopted membership aspects successfully. So what are the key parts of adopting this membership mentality? There are three key areas. The first is making sure you have exclusive and enduring value. This is the most important part. 
The second is making sure you recognize and celebrate the individual by personalizing to deepen connection. So even though they're a part of a membership, they feel like they're seen and heard. And the third is making sure you build a bridge to the community. Now, I want to be clear that not all of this applies to everything equally. There's a lot of nuance here. So this is obviously probably going to be a lot more helpful for consumer-facing products than maybe some B2B ones. But I do believe that if you apply this mentality, what you are going to see is a greater chance to be differentiated and to resonate. So as I go through these areas, um, for the PMs out there, I want you to think about your products, see if they have some of these features. And if they don't, maybe they should apply them. If you want to put your customer hat on, think about the subscriptions you have today or the ones that you canceled. And if they had these things, would, you, you know, would there be a better chance to retain you? So let's start with creating exclusive and enduring value. I want to be very clear here. This is not the same as product market fit. Product market fit is just baseline to have a successful product. For memberships, exclusive value is really important because that's a differentiator. That's how you feel like you're unique, you're part of something different, there's a scarcity effect. And basically, it's about creating real value that's really difficult to replicate. There are different ways, ooh, that looks funny. There are different ways that different companies do this. You can do this by having original content. You can have special partnerships and exclusive deals. I'm gonna take you all through the use case of Amazon Prime. So Prime was the first team that I joined when I worked at Amazon. And Prime's goal is to have so much disproportionate value that it's almost a no-brainer and irresponsible not to have Prime. It creates exclusive value for its customers by having things like original content on Prime Video, early access to books on Kindle. They've literally created a shopping day called Prime Day for its customers. And they have things like Buy With Prime, where you can use your benefits off of Amazon as well. One of the reasons why it's so exclusive is because it's created a breadth of offerings that are so large that it's literally difficult for competitors to copy. But beyond this exclusive value, it's also been able to endure and still is very, very popular today. So what are some of the things that it does? It also looks at other dimensions. So beyond exclusive value, it looks at how can I make sure I create value across different customer life cycles? So it has programs like Prime Student. Recently, it's invested in things like Pharma so that when you're older, you might have things like recurring prescriptions that you want. It's also expanded domains. So let's look at acquisitions and partnerships in areas like gaming and foods. It started off as a delivery, um, you know, it started off with delivery for retail, but it realized it could add value to so many other areas of a customer's life. And the last part that's important is that it suggests for trends and macro, you know, macro things that have happened in the environment. Realized that, like a lot of other companies during COVID, it recognized that it needed to double down on grocery, but a lot of its members were at home and they didn't really have that much to do. So that's why I started investing a ton in its digital content suite. So as you can see here, it's really important, again, to have that exclusive value, to, be, to also figure out how to make sure that value endures by looking at things like customer feedback, macro trends, and things like that. This way you can continue to evolve to meet emerging needs. Now, second, we're going to talk about recognizing and celebrating the individual through personalization. So when an individual feels a personal connection, we usually feel more satisfied. We feel more invested. And it's important to weave this across different customer interactions. I'm going to use Spotify as an example here because I think it does a really great job of this. And the first area is the offering. You have to make sure that your offering is curated for different customer segments, different behavior patterns, et cetera. Spotify does a really great job for this. Um, basically, it creates things like a daily mix or a discover weekly, where I'll look at the content of portfolio and come up with recommendations for songs that I might like. The next thing is looking at delivery flexibility. So delivery flexibility is also important. It's basically having things like options for different pricing tiers, different CX, and different modes that align with different use cases and consumption patterns. An example of how Spotify does this is it has things like private listening. So I use private listening a lot because I listen to you know, weird music. I don't want other folks who follow me to know what I'm listening to. 
Other things that I use are offline mode because I commute to work, so I'm often taking the train and I don't have access to Wi-Fi. And I use crossplay a lot because maybe I'll start a podcast at home and want to finish it while I'm walking to the train station. Having different options like this gives me the chance and flexibility to create my own ideal personalized experience, and it feels a lot more unique to me. Next is communications. Personalizing communications isn't about just slapping my name on an email and, and done. Personalizing communications is about demonstrating that you know the customer. One of the ways that Spotify does a really good job of this is with its wrapped campaign. So how many of you all look forward to looking at your Spotify wrapped at the end of the year? Yes, so I often look forward to this too. Um, for those who don't know, Spotify Wrapped is a sort of year-end review in terms of your usage habits. It has awesome things like trivia, um, who else is listening to some of the songs that you're listening to. And last year, they added listening personalities. So the personality I got assigned was a vampire. Did anyone else get a vampire last year? All right, one other person. <laughs> okay. We can talk afterwards. So vampires, apparently, they embrace darkness and they really love emotional, atmospheric music. So you guys can now understand why I listen on private mode here. I feel like I'm being publicly shamed for that. But I actually liked that. I mean, it was, it was, I'm not going to lie, it was accurate. It felt like they knew me and I had an identity that was assigned to myself. So that made me feel more invested. And the last thing is rewards. Not every business does this, but rewarding engagement is a really great way to recognize the individual progression. And if you personalize it, it makes it that much stickier. So Spotify does this with their Fan First program, where if you are a top listener for an artist, they will send you an email that's customized and gives you access to things like early access to merch or something else. I know this all seems like a lot. You don't have to do everything here immediately. I would say if you're going to start, though, I would go from left to right because that's what's the most important. We're almost done. Our third concept. This is about how do we bridge the individual to the community. And for this one, I want to talk about this in terms of varying degrees of member involvement. We're going to start from lowest to highest. So lowest is like minimal member involvement, and highest is that your member has to do a lot to feel like they're connected to the community. At the lowest end here um, would be things like user ratings or, inferencing the, or inferring things from engagement to create an aggregate view of what's trending or well-liked and popular. And this involves minimal work because basically members are either saying, yes, they like something, no, they don't, or they're actually not doing anything at all, and you're using their engagement behaviors to create this view. A lot of companies do this, Oop. like Netflix. Prime Video also does this. So let's say, um, so Prime Video on their site, they have a shoveler that shows the top 10 in the US. So I can be an individual consumer. I can turn it on, look at the app. I might want to figure out what am I watching today. When I see this, I see that Fallout is really popular. Who's seen Fallout, by the way? OK, not a lot of folks. You guys, it's, it's a great show, Prime Video, original. Uh, but I see that Fallout's really popular. Seeing this makes me feel connected to the other viewers. And it also creates an element of trusted discovery. Again, low lift for the member, but you still feel connected. Next is member spotlights. Member spotlights highlight individual achievements on websites or social media, and they serve as powerful testimonials. I'm going to share a personal anecdote here. Last year, I decided I wanted to learn a new hobby. So a pottery studio opened up around the corner for me, and I was like, OK, you know what? I'm going to be a potter now. I'll try ceramics. Um, I liked it, but I wasn't sure if I was going to continue. But lo and behold, one day, when I was on Instagram, what do I see on Betty's ceramics page? But a picture of myself and Yogi and this teapot that I was making. Not the most flattering photo, but something like this is awesome. It serves as social proof for the community. And for myself, I felt like it, I, I was recognized. My advocacy increased. And you know, when it came time to figure out and decide if I wanted to sign up for classes again, what do you think my answer was? Yes, you bet. I was compelled to. I mean, Yogi and I are technically ambassadors now. We're basically the face of the brand. Of course, we have to continue. All right, so the third one is around social connection. 
Things like this um, could involve the ability to follow other members, um, to connect with them, to give them a shout out. It wouldn't be one of my talks if I didn't do a Duolingo example. I talk about them a lot. Um, so Duolingo recognized the importance of personal connection, and it implemented features like the ability to add a friend or go on learning quests together. You can do things like nudge someone, you can give them a high five. And what they saw was that people who added a friend were 5.6 times more likely to finish a learning course. So you can see here how adding things like social connection makes people more deeply invested and engaged deeper with your product, and it increases loyalty. The last example here is around member-generated content. This, involves the mo this is the most amount of involvement because essentially it's businesses taking the mic and passing it over to members. It can include things like posts, comments, photos, social media posts or events. Um, a company that does this well is Peloton. So Peloton allows its community to do lots of different things. You can create community-based hashtags that you can follow. You can create playlists that you can use. And it also encourages folks to do things like show before and after photos that it will then repost on its social media sites. It's created an amazing following. And a lot of the community, actually, community building actually happens outside of the brand's own pages. So I think Peloton actually not only does a good job with member-generated content, but a lot of these different areas. And I found a commercial that I think does a good job of showing that. So I'm going to play it for you all now. Oh, maybe. Let's see. Do you want to play? OK. It might not be playing. I'm sorry. This was, it, had a, it had a nice song. It was going to be awesome. It was going to get you all hyped for a happy hour. And now it's not working. Are we sure we can't get the video to play? Oh, it's playing. Awesome. My leaderboard name is Feed Me King. My leaderboard name is Basil Rice 3. Captain Wong. Runs for Donuts. Run, lift, and lift. The Daily Quest. Thank God. I'm Blue Collar. Vegan Ariel. Jay and Lemma. So We're Peloton. We're a company built by a community. Our incredibly passionate community has been a force within Peloton from very early on in our company's history, driving our culture and inspiring innovation. Our community started their very own Facebook group, which now has over 200,000 members. They created our annual homecoming event in New York City, a chance to meet one another, their favorite instructors, and to work out together at our studio. And our community's desire to connect and support one another has also influenced product design, like our high five feature, People often ask us what a peloton is. It's a cycling term. It's a word for a pack who work together to fight the wind. From the very beginning, that's what we've done. And as a peloton, we've done it together. One big peloton family. Let's get it, baby. Hopefully the music woke some of you up who look like you're sleeping in the back and got you pumped up for happy hour. Um, just in time for some key takeaways. By the way, Peloton did not sponsor this. I just thought it was a good example for you all. But as far as key takeaways, subscriptions are not the same as memberships. Subscriptions are transactional. Memberships are relational. Subscription fatigue is a real thing. And there's lots of different ways to combat it. But I believe in leaning into social connection and applying a membership mentality. The key things there are making sure that you create exclusive value that can endure. Secondly, make sure that you personalize to deepen the individual's connection. And then the third is bridging to the community. I want to make sure you also don't just apply all this blindly. It's not one size fits all. So use judgment as you're doing this. And one last stat that I am going to leave you all with is that social connection can increase the odds of survival in humans by 50%. So by leading into relationships, you can not only potentially extend the life of your business, but also your customers. So no pressure there. And on that note, I encourage you all to go and you know, do some social connection right now at the happy hour, mingle and meet others. Um, thank you very much. <laughs>